And this is Bob Ferguson, and this is the next edition of Life with Bob, next episode. And tonight I have with me Bob Riley. Bob is a really, really good friend. We met many, many years ago at then Mayor Malloy's house, and somehow during that meeting, we just kind of connected. I saw you at the far back of the room, and your head was nodding, and my head was nodding, and we just kind of got together, and we have had a lot of conversation. Now, anyone who's on here will have seen your bio, so I won't uh, bother to go into all the details, but Bob is the kind of guy who I think, I, I really wish we had more Bob Rileys in the world. He's a consummate businessman, has, a, has, has more businesses than dogs have fleas. He's got a whole bunch of nested businesses together. His main business, Speed Energy, has been going for what, 40 years, Bob? Uh, about 35 for uh, feed energy and the related companies. Yeah, uh, but I've oh. been in the, the fats and oils business for about 45 years. There we go. There we go. And also involved in so many civic ventures that uh, you have to just read the bio. And I got the I got the very abbreviated bio. But tonight we're going to talk about the state of the world. <laughs> we're going to talk about uh, complex systems. How complex systems need to be regarded if we're going to solve our problems. And we'll look at that through the lens of what's happening in the Midwest, particularly what's happening in Iowa. And I'll let Bob tell his story about kind of how he got where, where he is and his thinking right now. But we had a major tragedy happen and that tragedy landed squarely on top of your business, Bob. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're not talking theory. We're talking about stuff that's actually happening that's, that's really impacting the lives of tens of thousands of people in Iowa and of course many, many hundreds of millions across the world. So Bob Riley, thank you very much for being my guest on Life with Bob. Well, you're welcome and I'm glad to be here. I'm not <laughs> sure where you want me to go. Uh, well, I... let, 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 let's talk a little bit about your background, a little bit about your businesses, a little bit about the uh, the kinds of things you involve yourself with and why do you involve yourself with them? And then uh, then we'll bring up the slides and we'll go through those slides, which I was very okay. impressed with the other day. Um, I think it's kind of a coincidence because I had an intern that just started today and um, uh, she's a junior from Simpson College where I'm on the board. And um, her, uh, her uh, internship got canceled this summer because of COVID and I threw kind of a, a hook in the middle of the pond and said, if there's anybody down there who has an interrupted internship, I'd be willing to take, take them on. So um, I started uh, uh, one today and uh, she asked me, well, how did you go from philosophy, a philosophy degree at, at Monmouth College, Illinois, to this fats and oils business that feeds you know 75 million animals around the Midwest? And um, that was a good question, because uh, uh, it is kind of a stretch to try to figure out how that happened. But um, my father was a lawyer, my uncle was a lawyer, my grandfather was a federal judge, and I had every intention of going to law school. And when I got to college, I thought the best preparation for law school would be to have a philosophy degree. That would teach me how to think, I mean, philosophy is love of knowledge, and I, you know, I like to go out and find stuff. I'm very curious. Uh, I'm also ADD, and that's another adds another layer of uh, of uh, intensity to the curiosity. Uh, and so, uh, I, I thought that's the best thing for me to do uh, to get some logic uh, in my head, get some uh, uh, knowledge of how different. Uh, cultures have thought about things over the, the centuries and uh, see if I can use that to be a basis for my law degree. Well, that was right during the Vietnam era. I got into, uh, mixed up with the draft and with the National Guard and with uh, uh, the uh, demonstrations down in Iowa City and we parted ways. Uh, but in that period of time, I was in a limbo and I didn't know if I was going to get drafted and I couldn't in all, uh, you know, con good conscience go to um, start on law school knowing that there's a good chance I might be interrupted. So I 
uh, I got a little job in an insurance business that kind of sucked my soul out. And then a friend of the family said, how would you like to come to work for a rendering company? And I said, well, I've heard of this company before, but I don't even know what rendering is. So I took my philosophy degree and walked in the back door of a rendering plant where they had dead animals and bones and heads and feet and all kinds of parts scattered around going through grinders and being heated up and french fried. And somehow or another this fit with my philosophy of waste not, want not, which I have always held very true to my soul. Um, and this was taking something that no one else wanted and turning it into something that was usable. And it just kind of struck a chord. And so that's what I did for the next 13 years. And then I had a chance to buy Feed Energy. We don't do the same things anymore in terms of all those uh, parts and things floating around. But uh, we do deal with um, all kinds of different uh, fatty acids and oils and, uh, and fats that uh, are fed to animals that allow them to reach their genetic potential and also can carry all kinds of nutritional goodies that, um, that improve the uh, immune system of the animals. So from philosophy to feeding animals sustainably, somehow or another, I glued that all together and, uh, and I'm making a living on it. So be a philosophy, be a philosophy degree exactly, right. if you're in school. Because it'll pay. It'll pay. It'll pay you really good, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, and as they say, and then what happened? Because uh, uh, running Feed Energy and Riverhead Resources, and you know, a whole basket of other you know related companies, is only one part of your life. The other part is a civic leader, uh, someone involved in numerous organizations and boards and universities, and uh, so. What is it about all that uh, that's important to you? Well, I think it started out with uh, the idea of uh, corporate social responsibility. Um, I do not ascribe to the low road capitalism of, you know, make as much money as you can, step on as many people as you need to, and cut as many corners as you want to, and don't pay any attention to the externalities and the costs to the common. I've always thought of business as being serving multiple masters from the shareholders to the, the customers to the vendors to the community in which you live and work the employees you know that's all kind of a, a inextricably a bound a group of of interested parties and i think you all have to treat them all with a, uh, the right amount of respect and so uh, from the very beginning, I always tried to figure out what can I do with the community at large to, uh, to help out. Um, you know, being an employer puts you at a particular level of both responsibility and, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, the, the, the community has a tendency to say, oh, well, this is a business. Uh, they must be something more than uh, just your normal run-of-the-mill whatever. So... I've always had a kind of an in to be able to walk into the Chamber of Commerce and say, hey, I'd like to volunteer. And they go, oh, you run this company, then sure, you can come here and do this. And uh, no matter where you went, you had this tendency to bring with you that business background that people thought was a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, I didn't have any money at the time, and so it was time and talent was all I could bring and no treasure. Uh, but as the business went on, I, you know, tried to bring all three things to the nonprofits that I dealt with. Um, the, the ones that I decided to get into, I found out later, fit into the concept of the seven capital. And the seven capitals are, uh, you know, financial capital, which is what everyone thinks about first, and environmental capital, which is the ruler of all capitals, and social capital, which that ties everything together. And then you have cultural capital, political capital, built capital, and human capital. So those seven capitals 
when working properly can make a sustainable society. So as I put down all the, the various organizations that I hung around with, and they, they go everything from the Iowa Department of Economic Development, where I was on that board. I founded the Iowa Innovation Corporation, which was a offshoot of, the, uh, of IDED, the uh, economic development, but it had more to do with innovation. I've been on the ISURF board up at Iowa State, the Iowa State University Research Foundation. So those were all kind of my financial or uh, the economic component of the seven capitals. But then I found myself doing things to try to improve human capital on uh, schools or school boards or being involved in a particular initiative or uh, being on the board at uh, Simpson or going back to my alma mater and teaching there. So I started seeing that all the efforts that I had seemed to fall in underneath these seven capitals. But I would still say my favorites are social capital and uh, natural capital or environmental capital. And that's how I, you know, I got into the climate issues uh, 10 years ago. I probably got into the climate issues back in the 70s when Lester Brown wrote the book, uh, The Population Bomb. And I'm thinking, what's the carrying capacity of this earth anyway? Right. And then you start to see, I've always been an outdoor person, and you start to see some of these anomalies happen. And you see the first graph of, you know, CO2 and you know, going up like a rocket and you're going, well, wait a minute, something's wrong here. So you know, I became aware of it a long time ago, but only active in it probably for the last 10 years or so. Um, so I've got a big thing about soil. I've got a big thing about water. I've got a big thing about climate. I've got a big thing about regenerative agriculture because we live in Iowa yep. and uh, it's too late to be sustainable. If we wanted to be sustainable, 150 years ago, I would have said, okay, we can do that. But we've already destroyed so much of our raw material that we use for uh, raising crops that it's now time to pay back and regenerate the soil that we've washed down the river and uh, try to figure out how to build it for the next generation or two or five. Uh, because otherwise we're, you know, we're toast. Well, you know, Bob, this, this broadcast does reach a national audience, and I think a lot of people don't think about the reality that all life on Earth depends on six inches of topsoil and the fact that it rains. If we look at the topsoils in Iowa, then if I'm not mistaken, in some areas were like eight feet deep that had been d developed, <clears throat> through cycles, uh, you know, since the last ice age, you know, when, when the Des Moines glacier uh, reached actually Des Moines Lobe, Des Moines, Iowa is where the bottom of the glacier went, and then it went retreated back. But all of the soil, and then it scraped everything bare, so it was just rock. So all the soil, all the prairie soils have been developed in the last 12,000 years. But as you point out, all the prairie soils have been developed over 12,000 12, years. And how much of that soil bank have we burned through? How much of our bank account have we burned through already? Well, the way I describe it, I guess there's two ways, both in terms of bulk and in terms of quality. And, um, you know, we started out with uh, 12,000 years of spring, winter, summer, fall, and prairies growing and dying and turning into mulch and uh, turning into soil after those 12,000 years. And we ended up in places in Iowa with 12 feet of topsoil. So it's a foot every thousand years is how fast you can make soil if you, you know, let nature do its job. If we manage it or try to, you know, with the hubris that we have saying, oh, we can beat Mother Nature, we can make more soil than a foot a thousand years. Well, maybe we can, but it really creates some intentionality. But uh, so we've lost about half of that topsoil. So. If you started out with 12, we're now down to six. If you started out with six, you're now down to three. But the soil health is the key, the organic matter that is in that soil. Uh, we used to have organic matter that was closer to five to 7%. Now it's like 1.8. So we're taking that organic matter down as quickly as we can 
And a lot of that, I think, is being done by, you know, the, the type of farming that we have where we've stripped all the nutrients out. And the only thing we have left is this lattice work of uh, very rigid soils that are very brittle and will wash away with the first rain, but they'll hold a root system so a corn plant can stand straight up and down. And you can run some nitrogen in through the roots and you can grow corn. Now you don't have, you have what I refer to as empty corn. It doesn't have the full complement of phytochemicals and all the things. I mean, you look at a cubic foot of soil and it contains like, you know, 5 billion uh, organisms if it's high in, or, in uh, organic matter, if the soil health is good. All these, you know, protozoas and fungi and, um, you know, you know, a thousand different type of critters. A lot of times when I go out and speak, I say, I want to triple the amount of livestock in Iowa. And people look at me like, oh my gosh, what are you talking about? Bob, you're an environmentalist. And I said, exactly. I want to triple it in the first foot of soil. There you go. So if we can get all those bugs back, we're going to be in much better shape. So when you think of soil, think both in terms of bulk and also think in terms of quality. You know, so fascinating. I have a little backyard garden and I have what I affectionately refer to as my soil factory, which is the compost pile. And I was digging into that because I was making a prairie strip garden. I had some trees, limbs cut off the trees, so I arranged it in some kind of an artful, odd shape and went to the compost pile and got a bunch of undecomposed and decomposed compost. And I, and I, I dug into one piece and I picked it up with my hand and it literally looked like my hand was crawling. It was yeah. just I mean, it was completely covered with worms. And the worms are the only things you can see. There's tens of thousands of other critters in there. So yeah, it's, uh, anyone, anyone who works with healthy, healthy soils, organic matter, you just realize how incredibly complex that system actually is. Well, there's a, uh, uh, you know, I think you mentioned it earlier, uh, people forget the fact that uh, we owe our total existence on the fact of six inches of soil and the fact that it rains. And uh, when you think of that whole agricultural cycle, the whole water cycle and uh, the growth of various things and the interaction between the nematodes and all that, it's so complex. You know, Bob Hatfield up at, uh, um, uh, of at Iowa State uh, yeah. is the uh, the guru on soil health, and uh, he's taught me so much. Um, but you know that's kind of where that that bumper sticker that came from uh, for Iowa State that says, actually, it is rocket science. <laughs> soil science, soil science is so much more complex than getting a man on the moon. Yep. Uh, you just can't imagine it. So if you're a systems person, if you think in terms of connectivity of various uh, links in the chain. You've got to go to soil health, you got to go to, uh, you know, the rainfall, you got to go to covers, cover crops and protecting that soil and building that soil because you're taking out certain nutrients, you got to put back certain nutrients. It is not a zero sum game. So you, you got to uh, keep on adding back in order to keep on taking. Um, I mean, I'm reminded of the first agriculturalists in the world. 300 million years ago, they were ants. And they were taking those leaves. You see the pictures of them, you know, and all these ants in a row taking these little chunks of leaves to their hives. They weren't taking them there to eat the leaves. They were taking them there to build compost to grow mushrooms. And that's what they ate. So we could learn from them. Absolutely. Okay, so that's, that's a pretty decent introduction. Thank you very much. It's just fascinating. Every time I hear your uh, background, I get a little bit bigger, more nuanced picture. So why don't we bring up the slides and give us a context of where you first gave this presentation and what was the purpose of it? And because this is going to be kind of holding the context of our, of our talk, and that is what's happening in Iowa and the Midwest. Uh, let me see if I can bring it up here. Share screen and uh, how's this? Uh, and do you see something that looks like a... Uh, looks an awful lot like a presentation. Okay, so there we go. Uh, 
So the key here is um, I put this together, I guess just the other night, very quickly for uh, Susan Judkins, who uh, wanted me to talk to the uh, EDF folks. So uh, that's the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, they put some uh, people in Iowa and four or five other states saying we need to talk about climate and we need to talk about these types of things. Um, and we need to do it uh, for this election period. So right. that's a key component. Um, so uh, I put this together and uh, for that, but it's kind of a compilation of a lot of different things that I've had over the years. So um, if you want, I'll just go through. Um, and the key, you know, I, I am kind of a provocateur, you know, I'm Irish. And so it's, uh, is this a private fight or can anybody get into it? <laughs> right. so I have a tendency to throw grenades in the middle of the room and just see what happens. But so provoking thought leaders, I think, is an appropriate title to the people that are watching this uh, um, this uh, webcast. So uh, uh, the way that I look at it to start with is that you know you got to be a systems thinker, worldwide systems thinker, and then you have to bring it down to a local level. And so that old mantra of think globally and act locally really fits here. Uh, but if you think of the agro, uh, agriculture and the environmental culture uh, tied together, this is a system that is inextricably bound. You cannot separate those two. And for people to say, no, I'm in the agriculture business, but I hate environmental stuff is crazy because that's like saying, I hate inhaling, but I love exhaling, you know? That doesn't fit, they're, they're both tied to each other. So think in terms of uh, this as a set of linked links in a chain that really makes it all work. So as I said before, you know, I saw that rise of CO2 going past 400 and um, I'm going, the acidification of the ocean. We just had 100 degrees in the Siberian uh, Arctic Circle. Uh, I mean, how crazy is this? We've seen calving glaciers. Uh, um, Iceland, I was there in, uh, a couple of years ago, and the I Iceland is raising out of the, rising out of the sea because the glaciers are melting so fast, they were the weight that kept it down. And so now the glaciers are going, and Iceland is is rising up out of the sea. You can see that melting, uh, the earth is melting and we are not doing anything about it. As societies and as leaders, um, that is being stymied primarily by what's going on in Washington today with the leader that we have. But also individuals uh, are continuing to try to deny it. And it has something to do with our, the way we talk about it and it has something to do with our the language that we use with each other and the language that we know. And if I don't have the language to describe it, I'm probably gonna say, I don't know what you're talking about. And so it's hard to convince people of science when they have a, a no science, scientific language. So um, another thing that I'm interested in, I guess, is the fact that uh, this is the nine boundaries that have been identified as being at risk. Of these, climate is one of them. And the other ones are just as important, primarily the ones that are really in deep trouble, which has to do with genetic diversity, which you can see over here on this, uh, this one leg. Um, and then also on the biogeochemical flows, with phosphorus and nitrogen being relocated and dislocated. And that has thrown this whole concept of the nine boundaries. And these are earth boundaries. These are things that we can't go beyond um, and that will be our limiting factor. That's where we're in the biggest amount of trouble. Um, we see issues with land system change and some others, but, uh, and we're obviously in the yellow with climate change, but we're rapidly going to red. So um, we want to stay out of that, uh, 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 we want to stay out of that end zone of uncertainty down at the bottom, that yellow, because that's where 
we're going to get into trouble. If we can stay in the safe boundary, that green area in the front, in the middle, we're okay. But there's a lot of stuff going on out there. It is a big system, and we have to pay attention to the interaction between the pieces in the system. So um, another component, I guess, has to do with the fact that forever and ever and ever, people have looked at the financial or the economical as the driving force in mankind's system. And they've looked at the ecosystem or the natural capital as being a component of the larger economy. And they have uh, mined it and have done whatever they wanted to do, taken all the timber off, taken all the coal out, uh, you know, taking all the sand away, run all the dirt away, uh, ruined all the soil, done whatever they felt they wanted to do for the sake of some income without regard for the ability to maintain the asset. So it's, I mean, go back to Grimm's fairy tales or some of some fairy tale somewhere that talked about the goose that laid the golden egg. You don't kill the goose that laid the golden egg. That's number one. Same thing, you know, you can milk a cow forever, but you can only kill it once. We have taken our uh, economy as the king and ignored the benefits that nature provides. And that is a, um, a sin that we need to flip. And so we need to flip it so that the economy is a subset of our ecosystem. That if the ecosystem is in good shape, then the economy will be in good shape. And that's one of the things that I continue to try to, to uh, get people to understand is that the, uh, the recycling of that economy uh, and the waste that we make, uh, because it's not going to be efficient. I mean, it's just like nature. There's a lot of recycling that goes on in nature. So we have to take those waste and recycle them back into the front end of the system be more like the, the uh, be more like nature and, and have biomimicry as our designing factor. So when you think of systems thinking, think of biomimicry as a system that really works well. And that uh, will take our sustainability to where it needs to be in our system, utilizing the Earth's capacity and our ingenuity to rebuild these resources. So that's a big thing. If you think the economy is more important than the environment, try holding your breath while counting your money. I mean, it's as simple as that. If you can't get through that through your head, you have got a misplaced set of principles and understanding. I will say, because of these complex systems with all the moving parts, it's really hard to see that something that I do today will come back way later and bite me. As we see here, we think these uh, just knocking down this block to make my view a little bit better is a pretty good thing until finally the blocks come all the way around like dominoes and the effect of that first movement, that first cause is felt later. And that's a very difficult thing for some people to understand, but we have to figure out how to, uh, how to talk with them in that language. So I've put together a vision for Iowa. Um, so I'm taking this global and coming down to local. Our soil, our water, our energy, our food, food and fuel. And I'm saying that we are the epicenter of modern agriculture. We will leverage our innovation and can-do spirit to achieve the Our Iowa ideal. Soil, water, and energy that is regenerative, robust and resilient, the same as our healthy, innovative, and connected rural economy. So I'm trying to marry the regenerative nature of our environment with our healthy, innovative, and connected rural economy. I think there's a way to make that happen so that our rural Iowa can, instead of being uh, this close to bankruptcy every year when the price of corn is again less the price it takes to make it. And when we're all price uh, takers instead of price makers, we have to figure out a way to fix that. And that's where I'm trying to do this. 
I don't know if you've ever seen the picture of uh, the the uh, 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 biological uh, and transpirational energy and photosynthetic energy in the Midwest, mm -hmm. but it's it's more intense in the upper Midwest here in August than it is in the uh, in the Amazon. So wow. we have more sun and water and soil and nutrients moving through our systems in, uh, in the upper Midwest than any other place on the planet. So we have the ability to take all this sunlight and convert it to biomass and do various things with it, but we only use about 3% of it and let the rest kind of waste. So our key is, we have to fix this, and the way to do that is to reignite Iowa's lasting values. So let's realign Iowa with that rural, urban, and public-private partnership. We can add the value of and wealth of Iowa's landscape into the system, uh, and we accomplish this for everybody, because I don't know if you know it or not, but people pay attention to Iowa. They pay, pay attention to Iowa State, when Iowa State says something that ripples all around the world because everyone looks at them for agricultural advice. So we have some things going on up at Iowa State now that accomplish this. Uh, Lisa Sholey Moore and her sea change is a perfect example of regenerative agriculture that ties the economy and the people and the soil and the markets together. So it's a great thing. Um, and we do this through the exercise of all those seven capitals that I talked about, the natural, social, financial, cultural, built, political, and human. So the way that we do this is, since we are the epicenter of modern agriculture, we are also the epicenter of the solutions to these modern day challenges. There's more brain power in Iowa than you can shake a stick at. We have some of the best DNA for innovative thinking that we've gotten from you know, going, up, going back to Henry Wallace, going back to uh, Henry A. Wallace, Henry C. Wallace, uh, Uncle Henry. You know, we've got lots of Wallaces back there. We've got um, Harry Stein. We've got uh, the recipients of the F World Food Prize are great Iowans. Uh, we've got some of the uh, John Deere folks and the uh, Collins folks. We've got plenty of people as examples to show us that we can figure stuff out. And if we put our head to it, we can. 30 years ago, Iowa was seen, or 40 years ago, Iowa was seen as one of the most progressive, high education, high literacy states. We've let it slide since then and turned around and put um, people in charge that would rather divide than progress, but uh, that will come to pass. Um, it's in our DNA to make something better. So. I want to make sure that we do not go down the low road capitalism route, that we are not exploiting the, uh, the environment and the people that work the land. Uh, we want a legal system that codifies the risks and shares that with the public and the, the profits that is shared with the public. The way that we've uh, drifted in the past is we socialize the risks among many and we privatize the profits. That's just immoral. And so we've got to figure out a way to fix that. So our system is near collapse, but I think we have a way to figure that out. And uh, we need to adapt it over time and through continuous improvement, but we know the answer here. It's that biomimicry, systems thinking, regenerative agriculture uh, that provides the most healthy products to our healthy soil and shows the rest of the world that we can do this with quality. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, let me see if I can get my slide to move. There we go. This is my um, Google map shot of my plant in Pacific Junction, Iowa, that in March of 2019 was under 12 and a half feet of water. I built that plant down there in about 2000. <clears throat> And I didn't do the due diligence that it was necessary for me to use my head. Because had I gone onto Google and looked at this plant from, you know, 10 miles up or however far it is, I would see that the floodplain from the Platte River emptying into the Missouri 
many times overflowed and came all the way out here, all the way up to Pacific Junction and to the foothills of the Lust Hills. And that was the Missouri River. It was that wide many, many years out of the last hundred million years. And um, our society in its infinite wisdom decided to come in and put dikes down both sides of that river that were about uh, 50 yards off the river. So we've said, we're not gonna give you a mile and a half or a three mile floodplain. We're gonna give you a hundred yards. Well, the river in 2019 said, no thanks, not my cup of tea, and blew out the levee here at the end of the Platte River and filled this whole basin with 12 and a half feet of water. So the reason that that we had all this water coming down the Missouri River was because we had such heavy snowfall this fall, the, the winter before, and such heavy rainfall during the spring. And the reason we had this is because, as Gene Tackley would say, we had that Southern Oscillation Index that came up and warmed the air up in this neck of the woods and made higher snowfall levels and higher rainfall levels. And all this was on the basis of a warming planet, that we can tie all this back to these systems that have pushed us around for the last, you know, 50 years as this climate has changed. It has moved lots of things in the system so that we end up with uh, the problems of a floodplain that is now becoming part of the river again whether we like it or not. And so, you know, there's that old advertisement of you can't fool mother nature. Well, I have found out in my, uh, at my plant, you cannot build in a floodplain and feel like you're gonna be safe. So we've had to abandon that plant because of climate change. And this might be my first and last effort at building uh, on the floodplain because I see no, uh, no way to do that ever again. So we've abandoned this plant and tried to figure out what else we can do elsewhere. So you can see this water goes as far as the eye can see. It destroyed a town up here called Pacific Junction. Uh, there were four or five businesses along this road that it took out and uh, just for, you can see this Quonset hut over here on the left side of the picture. That's a 14 foot door and there's about two and a half feet uh, remaining there. So we had 11 or 12 feet of water in there and that's what made this uh, what it is today. So we're, uh, we're done here. So again, Houston, we have a problem the strength of the total agricultural system from crops through feed to animal, animal production is an inextricably tied to Iowa soil. Actually, it is rocket science. Iowa soil can be the solution to many of our climate woes by incorporating cover crops and other products into our soil that have deep roots and we can sequester carbon in Iowa soil and also build Iowa soil back to what it should be. And so as we're in this problem, we have Iowa farmers that can get us out of it. So you can see that these are very complex systems, heat waves and droughts and human health and diversification and the stratospheric ozone and biodiversity loss. This is a very complex system. And if you don't think it's complex, you really need to look deep into each one of these pieces and you can see how they uh, affect our agricultural productivity. And if we uh, think that we are doing this on our own and that we can manage our way out of this, we're just fooling ourselves into thinking that. So again, I have this little cartoon is agriculture from A to G, starting with clean, slow water and soil that stays in place we can make healthy plants, healthy air, healthy people, and end up with a healthy and happy community. So we just have to get over ourselves 
in order to get here. This Iowans love progress, but hate change has got to change. It's got to switch so that we can love progress and we can make it change. But that's up to us because as we've said before, we owe our existence to six inches of topsoil and the fact that it rains. So I'll close with uh, what we all ought to be doing, whether you're wearing a mask or not, do unto others downstream as you would have those upstream do unto you. And that's all I got. Wow, Bob. This is just, just amazing. Absolutely amazing. So uh, <clears throat> we have Craig and Jeff and Sue and James and Jen Browning on. Um, if any one of you would like to make a comment or ask a question, uh, please feel free. Uh, anyone who is on Facebook, uh, the link to the webinar is there in the Facebook, uh, in our Facebook invitation in my, in my post. And so if you want to jump in, uh, but if anyone has a comment, uh, you can either type it in the chat or just raise your hand and I will recognize you and uh, allow you to speak. So why don't we do that? So as people are thinking about that, uh, Bob, so where do we go from here? What, what, are the, what are the things that Jan and James and Jeff and Sue and Craig and other people who may be watching on Facebook, what can we do? What can an individual do? Well, um, that's, that's a good question. I mean, it, we, we talk a lot about policy. We talk a lot about big issues. We talk a lot about uh, uh, what can the government do? What can my neighbor do? But only at the last resort do we come down to, well, what can I do? And <coughs> I think oh, that's a difficult thing because we think about uh, the effect of a policy, the policy of making everyone wear seatbelts you know, saved 100,000 lives. Uh, individually, we saved 100,000 lives. And so we, as we turn around to look at how we can make, um, make a change ourselves in our habits, our buying habits, our voting habits, our, um, how we speak to our neighbors, and the fact that we need to, instead of using your thumbs to run the garage door opener and the remote on your TV, get outside, go next door and see what your neighbors are thinking about and talk to them about climate. And so let's see how all that fits into the system and how we can make things work. Um, it's necessary for uh, us to be involved in that, uh, actively involved in the solution. And that's getting together over coffee. That's getting together over 10 people in a church basement. That's doing what Matt uh, Russell is doing, getting uh, uh, church dice or getting um, uh, the church uh, members uh, into the basement and talking to them about regenerative agriculture and so the solutions that we need the farmers to bring out. So this is the kind of stuff that really makes sense. Uh, it's us going out and talking about it. And at that point, we're gonna start to get some uh, systems change going on here. The brain power at Iowa State's making that happen. Um, we need to adopt it over here. We need to talk about it as individuals. And in this day, this day of COVID, we do all those things maybe on Zoom until things uh, blow over. But yeah, it's, it's a getting together. That's one of the things that we've talked a lot about and actually worked a lot, uh, Bob. Uh, Fairfield is an interesting experiment because we have a higher percentage of people who think about these things and care about these things than in the average population. We also had a bunch of people who wanted to live in a small Iowa town where there were no jobs. And so starting 42 years ago, we actually created pretty much out of our imagination, collective imagination, an entrepreneurial culture that has developed many thousands and thousands of jobs. And so uh, you know, one of the things that we did is I, we were at a meeting and you posed something and said, well, we have a, we have a, uh, what is the corridor from Ames to Des Moines? Yeah, the cultivation corridor from cultivation Des Moines. Corridor. That's owned by the biotech guys and gals. And you said, well, you're amusing. and said, we should have a regeneration corridor going from Des Moines to Fairfield. You know, right, right across the state. 
So we ended up having a couple of meetings, the very fruitful meetings, thinking about that, bringing people as far as Houston up for those meetings. And then the great floods happen and you get a little distracted. But you know, we were talking before, just because a particular effort doesn't bear fruit in exactly the way you want, the conversation after conversation after conversation does, if you keep it in your attention, collective attention, burst forth into other structures. Like we're creating the Jefferson County Food Growers Co-op. It's not as grand a vision as a regenerative quarter, but it's a tremendous vision for, with the bold, hairy, audacious goal of creating enough people food, regeneratively produced people food, that if we wanted to, we could feed the whole county. Now, it's not that high a bar because we got 293,000 acres and only 17,000 people. But it's still quite a thing to do that, given the incumbent system, given that it's easy to go to the grocery store. Now think about where your food came from. Uh, so what I have perceived in my time here in Fairfield since I came back in 2006 is the absolute power of individual citizens who have an idea about something getting together and talking about it. Interestingly, complex system theory of my little teeny tiny half a thimble worth of knowledge of that says that if you want to progress, talk. If you want to progress, converse more, converse more, converse more. And out of that conversation comes, even though it may seem like it's not going anywhere, comes these structures and these potentialities that happen. But before we get too far off into the philosophical weeds, Craig says, what's your opinion of the current voluntary water quality initiatives in Iowa? Uh, my friend Craig asks the tough questions. Um, well, uh, first, our, the Iowa nutrient reduction strategy uh, is not working. We all know that. Um, the numbers that we have seen from uh, the hydraulic lab at Iowa City, who has uh, gauges on all the rivers that looks at the flow, looks at the nitrate loads, looks at some of these other uh, issues that we have in our in our watersheds. Uh, it's not working. So uh, um, as we have indicated, it's going to take something like 15,000 wetlands to make uh, to to make the dent that's necessary on some of those uh, nutrients that we're trying to reduce. Uh, and I think we've got 300 of them that we made in the last few years. Um, and uh, so we know that that's not working. Um, and it's been a, quote, voluntary system. Um, and when you say voluntary, really, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting because when you start back at the Magna Carta, when, uh, or the Statute of Merton, when they uh, allowed the barons to take over the commons, fence them in and call them their own. That was when we first started talking about private property and the ability to do with our property whatever we wanted without taking any responsibility for downstream. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you'd build factories on rivers so you could run your sewage out the pipe of the factory down the river. Well, we stopped that in the 70s, but uh, uh, you know, for centuries, that's how people treated their waterways. It was a way to, let's get rid of our water. When we then turned around and designed our agricultural system, it was get rid of the water in the swamp that was Iowa. I mean, you know, we were known for our mosquitoes well before Minnesota was. So we have, uh, uh, we used to be just a big swamp, but we drained that swamp and we tiled it and we figured out how to get rid of that water as fast as we possibly could so that we could get into the fields and utilize that 12 feet of topsoil that we've now utilized down to six feet. But um, uh, we wanted to get in there and farm that ground. And so I think one could say that the system that we've designed would not be the way that you would design it if you started from scratch. Um, if I were gonna you know, be king for the day back in 1150, and say, okay, let's put together a system that is sustainable and regenerative and does not, um, uh, you know, pays attention to your downstream neighbors. How would I design that? Well, right now we've designed it that says there's no law that says I can't 
uh, do whatever it is I want to do with my water, and therefore I'm going to do whatever it is with my water. I that's a voluntary system. Now it's also voluntary for people to say, you know, I've decided that my neighbor down the way, uh, every time it rains, it runs uh, 20 tons of dirt out of my field onto his field, and um, maybe I ought to slow that down a little bit and stop that. Well, that's a voluntary thing too, although that has been codified into law. So you cannot pollute, if you will, with dirt your neighbor downstream uh, by allowing your erosion to run on his land. So there are some laws that limit the amount of freedom that we have to uh, voluntarily let stuff go downstream. So it's really kind of a misnomer when we, uh, when we say, oh, this is a voluntary system. What it is is that it's an immoral system that allows us to do unto others downstream something that we wouldn't want people upstream to do unto us. And so when you think of all the molecules that are in an acre, it's really our responsibility to our answer, to our, you know, the, our descendants um, and to ourselves and our neighbors to keep everything, that, all the molecules that we have on this acre of land where they are. And we can take the rain and we can do with it what we want and we can clean up the water before we send it out, but really, you shouldn't have any worse water going off your land than what's falling onto your land. And so can we put together practices that will maintain the quality of that product, the water, the soil, and not let it go downstream? Can we do that? Well, to me, that's uh, something that we should look to see who's interested in making that happen. Our, uh, the way we buy and sell land, does not pay any attention to how much land has been lost over the last 10 years through erosion. It just says there's an acre, square acre of land. It doesn't value, it values a little bit of the <clears throat> corn and soybean rating, but it does not do the soil health or the soil volume. And so if I were a banker, I would say, geez, you're letting all my collateral go down to the Mississippi. Uh, and I would, as a banker, mandate that my farmer put up the right things to keep my asset that I have the most interest in, keep that asset whole. And, you know, theoretically to build it up. So our system is broken. So calling it a voluntary system, it's really an involuntary, uh, it has been the involuntary takeover of land uh, by people who then turn around and treat it as if it not, is not part of the commons, and therefore they, uh, they feel like they can use it any way they want and uh, be, um, you know, put whatever practice on it they want, mine it for all it is, and then they can sell it and go on. Um, to me, it's a, it's a broken system. Now that said, I think that people downstream probably have a vested interest in trying to persuade the people upstream on what they should do. And that in our present system of low road capitalism, the only way to do that is to go upstream and say, hey, can I pay you some money to keep that stuff on your land? To keep that water on your land, to keep the soil on your land, to keep those nutrients on your land. And if I've got that uh, as a societal value downstream, I think I ought to be able to go up and say to the people upstream, here's what I'll pay you to make that happen. And that ought to be a good deal for them. So that way, as a farmer, I can get two or three different um, income streams, one from my crops, one from the eco services that I provide to those people downstream, one another maybe from uh, a building soil, and therefore my banker says, you don't need to have so much um, uh, equity or so much um, uh, uh, you know, assets that, that are, are under control here by me because you've been building soil these last 10 years. Your, va your land is much more valuable. So you can buy it for 5% down instead of 20% down. And so I think the whole financial system could change with that. Um, 
So I think we need to, in the interim, before we get back to some sort of uh, uh, understanding of the, the value of our land to our descendants and to the common, um, and having some responsibility for what we do with that land, much like what we would do with the air or what we would do with the Arctic. I mean, the Arctic up to now has been not the property of any country, and therefore we've treated it with some sort of respect. Uh, we don't have that situation now because individuals get to determine what they want to do. If they want to dig up all their land and put it in 50 pound bags and sell it to China, I think there's no law that says you can't do that. So we need to have a, a different morality within the land owning uh, public. And then we also have to pay the, uh, during the system that we have now, we have to pay those people upstream to do what we want them to do and make it worth their while. And it, at that point, they will turn into, you know, uh, these people upstream that are doing the right thing. You know, Bob, that is, that is a beautiful, beautiful point to end on. And I think we could take any number of these avenues of thought that we've opened up and do another one of these talks, and we will definitely do that. I will put this into uh, the archive. This will be archived in the Life with Bob uh, group in Facebook and also Life with Bob YouTube channel. And I will ar I'll archive a wonderful article that I, there's many, many that have written on the Balinese water temples. For thousands and thousands of years, priests at those temples have, everyone in the area has given them a, the authority and they have the knowledge over, th over you know, thousands of years, exactly how to apportion the water. And so that, that central controller of the commons, by everyone's consent, is the one who changes the sluice gates and sends water here, sends water there. And when that is done, everyone has enough water. You know, the idea that I read uh, Robert Reich's book, uh, the, uh, uh, the Common Good, and he talks about the fact that if you raid the commons, you can look like you can look like you're really brilliant for a while, right? Because no one's watching. It's a commons, right? So you go and you graze your cattle more because it's a voluntary system, as you pointed out. Well, as soon as you start doing that, the commons breaks down. So we can certainly talk about that and many other things. Uh, so folks who are, who are watching either on Facebook or in the webinar here, thank you very much for being here. Bob, thank you for your brilliant exposition. Uh, we're gonna find some way of getting this into the hands of uh, some of our esteemed legislatures, uh, leg legislators here in Iowa, just to, uh, just to kind of mix it up and um, give them a little bit of feedback. But uh, Is this yeah, a private fight or can anybody get into it? Yeah, this, no, this is definitely not a private fight. Anyone. Anyone can get into this rumble, and uh, by God, we have to. Yeah, really, and we. Th this is a fight that we can't stop by. We all got to jump in and do what we can. So, Bob, thank you very much for being here, and folks on Facebook, we'll finish this uh, live broadcast, but uh, we'll be back. Uh, and just look for the announcements. Uh, Monday night, I took a little bit of time off during the COVID time, but I'm back with. Monday Night Live with Bob at 8 p.m. Central. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you.